Greetings, my dear friends. Greetings, dear brethren. Greetings, dear family, whoever, uh, wherever you are, all around the world. My name is Alexander Sashevelich. I'm elder in the Continued Church of God, and I feel that uh, in the light of approaching of the most satanic of all the holidays, I am obligated to ask you why are there strange customs of Halloween, and why should you, if you're Christians, follow such customs? When I was a student in the 1990s, uh, I attended a college which in the 70s published a nice publication, which was entitled exactly with this. It says, Why the Strange Customs of Halloween? And it is amazing, you know, that in the last century and in the centuries past, there have been people, great thinkers and great authors, both males and females, who put together very valuable books informing us about the satanic nature of the Halloween. However, it seems as we just continue to progress through time, the people just have less and less interest in the truth, they seem to be having less and less interest in reading, and they seem that they have lost totally connection with the God of the Bible and His commandments. Now, you should ask yourself, before you indulge into that fun liking and uh, in, in that holiday which seems to be a great fun for all family, you should be asking yourself, where did Halloween come from? And why should you observe it anyway? Because, you know, very few realize that, you know, that in this so-called enlightened 21st century, people have come to observe such a superstitious custom. Now, that's the strangest holiday, I think, of, of, of the entire year. Because on the eve of November the 1st, then children in many lands, they dress as goblins or as witches, they knock on doors, they announce trick or treat, they soap windows of schools and stores and, you know, some tear down mailboxes and give the police a great many headaches every single Halloween night. Now, you see, to perpetuate the spirit, the spirit of Halloween with its frolicking fun, you know, stores are filled with black and orange masks and they're filled with pumpkins and other gaudy decorations to attract the customers. I've read that the revenue of... Uh, selling Halloween requisites uh, has been I think has been re has been a great record in the was it last or a couple of years ago or in the last year whatever so even some older people unfortunately they enjoy games and frivolity on that night now my dear friends in this enlightened so-called age you know with ignorance and superstition supposedly banished we find actually many nations still celebrating this old holiday with its goblins and, uh, you know, the fear of black cats and children masked as demons or witches. And then what you have in the West and unfortunately even increasingly now here in the East, in the schools, you have all of those uh, processions. You have children marching in weird processions during the day and then they anticipate a hectic night, you know, which will be filled with fun and foolishness. This strange holiday has totally pagan, satanic origin. And you should ask yourself, is this the way that in which Christian children should be brought up? And why is that, why is this holiday celebrated in any way? Now, where did, where did that custom of trick and treat originate? So, you know, if you think you're intelligent and you're educated, well, start looking into the origin. There is enough material in English speaking countries. There is enough, you know, that you can look into the origin of that spirit of frivolity and understand how it entered a supposedly Christian society. How did all of you Anglo-Saxon and other peoples got your Halloween? And do you know what Halloween was, what, that Halloween was introduced into the professing Christian world centuries after the death of the Apostles of Christ? And yet, you know, Halloween was celebrated by the pagan centuries before the New Testament Church was founded. Now, those are the facts, and I think those facts are well known, and uh, they shouldn't be any subject of your ignorance. Here is the history. There is a book written by Ralph and Adlan Linton. Linton is called Halloween Through 20 Centuries. It was published in 1950 in New York. And I'm quoting now from that book. It says... The American celebration rests upon Scottish and Irish folk customs, which can be traced in a direct line from pre-Christian times. 
which actually, friends, means from paganism. And then this, these two authors continue. It says, although Halloween has become a night of rollicking fun, superstitious spells, and eerie games, which people take only half seriously, its beginnings were quite otherwise. The earliest Halloween celebrations were held by the Druids in honor of Samhain, Lord of the Dead, whose festival fell on November 1st. So this is a quote from the book Halloween Through 20 Centuries by Ralph and Adeline Linton, and it is on page 4. My dear friends, the earliest Halloween celebrations were not held by the early church, but by the Druids in honor of the Lord of the Dead. In Encyclopedia Britannica, in the 11th edition, now it is very interesting how all this precious information of pagan holidays has been deleted or omitted in the uh, later volumes of Encyclop Encyclop Encyclopedia Britannica. But here in volume, volume 12 of the 11th edition of Encyclopedia Britannica, on page 857, you will find that Halloween was a druidic belief, that there was a druidic belief connected to Halloween. So it was a druidic belief that on the eve of this festival, Saman, Saman, Lord of Death, called together the wicked souls, or spirits, that within the past 12 months had been condemned to inhabit the bodies of animals. And you see, that is what was that celebration, November celebration like. It was actually a pagan belief that on one night of the year, the souls of the dead returned to their original homes, and there they had to be entertained with food. Now, if food and shelter were not provided, these spirits, it was believed, of course, by pagans, would cast spells and cause havoc towards those failing to fulfill their requests. And you see, it was spiritual trick or treat. And the trick was not especially cute. I'm going to read you from the book entitled Highland Superstitions by the author Alexander MacGregor. And on page 44, he says, It was the night for the universal walking about of all sorts of spirits, fairies, and ghosts, all of whom had liberty on that night. And what happened? What, what was happening on that night was also the literal sacrifices that were offered on this night to the spirits of the dead, my dear friends. They were offered, you know, to the dead, because the belief was that the dead visited their earthly haunts and their friends. And why do you think that in these modern days, around Halloween, thousands of children disappear in your English-speaking world, in your Anglo-Saxon nations? What do you think happens to those children? Well, of course, they're sacrificed to the Lord of the Dead, to Satan the Devil. And there was also a reason why November, as the month, was chosen for that particular event. Because, you see, the Celts... And other northern people, they considered the beginning of November as their new year. So this was the time when the leaves were falling and the general seasonal decay was taking place everywhere. So thus it was very, you know, fitting time. So that's how the pagans reason. It was a fitting time for the commemoration of the dead. Because the nature is going to be dead. So now they were commemor to commemorate the dead, you know, in, in the fall or in the autumn. Now, since the northern nations at that time, ancient time, they began their day in the evening, then the eve leading up to November 1st was, of course, the beginning of the festival. And according to the Roman calendar, in which days began, began at midnight, it was the evening of October 31st, and that is why we have Halloween, or All Souls' Eve, and it was kept throughout the ancient pagan world. So this observance was very widespread. In uh, book Folklore, written by James Napier, on page 11, James Napier says, There was a prevailing belief among all nations that at death the souls of good men were taken possession of by good spirits and carried to paradise. But the souls of wicked men were left to wander in the space between the earth and moon or consigned to the unseen world. These wandering spirits were in the habit of haunting the living, but there were means by which these ghosts might be exorcised. So, you know, that was the night where the exorcising 
go exercising of ghosts took place. And to exercise these ghosts, that is to free yourself from their supposed evil sway, you would have to set out food. You know, you would have basically you have to give the demons a treat and provide shelter for them during the night. If they were satisfied with your offerings, it was believed that they would leave you in peace. If not, they would trick you by casting an evil spell on you. It is also interesting to see that in uh, another book on the customs in Wales, it is book entitled Folklore and Folk Stories of Wales, written by Mary Trevelyan. On page 254, she writes, In Wales it was firmly believed that on All Hallows' Eve the spirit of a departed person was to be seen at midnight on every crossroad and every stile. End of the quote. So you see, this sort of Halloween festival was very strenuously and strictly observed throughout the ancient world because pagans would pray to their false gods to prevent demons and witches from molesting them. In Cambodia, for example, in Asia, people used to even chant to their ancestors, Oh, all you, our ancestors who are departed, dine to come and eat what we have prepared for you and to bless your posterity and make it happy. You know, it's written in one in one publication about Cambodia. Now in this new world, meaning basically Mexico and uh, Latin and, and Northern America, there was also custom which is found, which was recorded by famous James Fraser, author James Fraser in his book Adonis, on page 244, in which he writes that the mystics of Mexico believed that the souls of the dead came back in the twelfth month of the year, which corresponded to our November, says James Fraser. And then he continues, On this day, all souls, the houses were decked out to welcome the spirits. Jars of food and drink were set on the table in the principal room, and the family went out with the torches to meet the ghosts and invite them to enter. Then, returning to the house, they knelt around the table and with their eyes bent on the ground, prayed the souls to accept the offerings. End of the quote. So you see, my dear friends, it means that, you know, that is, this is the way the heathen world celebrated their Halloween, their All Souls Day. And although, you know, some priests of the Halloween festival varied, you know, there's some various aspects that varied from country to country, the overall pattern and purpose remained exactly the same. And then Halloween became Christianized. So the professing Christian world came to accept and keep such a day. Now you might wonder, how did it happen? Well, for numerous, you know, years prior to the 6th century, Rome was invaded and ruled by barbaric tribes from the north. And then in the year 607, the Roman Emperor Phocas defeated the barbarians and the Roman Pantheon, which is basically their uh, temple with their gods, the Roman Pantheon, which was a pagan edifice, was now you know, retaken by the Romans from the barbarians and it was given to Pope Boniface IV. Now, what happened also, you know, Emperor Hadrian, the Roman Emperor Hadrian, he rebuilt the Pantheon around 100 AD, and he dedicated that to the pagan goddess Sibylla, or Sibylla, and also he dedicated the temple to the other Roman deities. Now, this temple then, you know, became basically the central place in Rome, where all the pagans would flock to honor and commemorate their gods. Now, with this splendid, you know, edifice, which was now falling into the hands of the professing Christians, the question was, what should be done with pagan pantheon? Well, after several ideas were put forward, they decided, finally, that, you know, whereas the pagan dedication had been to Sibylla and all the gods, the Roman bishop now came, came forward and he consecrated that edifice to the Virgin Mary and all the saints of both sexes. This is explained in the book, The Mysteries of All Nations, on page 120. And now this pagan holiday, uh, pagan uh, uh, edifice, pagan shrine, pagan building became a holy, under quotation mark, a holy structure. So no more, you know, did the pagans use this edifice to pray to their, and uh, to pray for their dead. Now it was now the Christ professing Romans who employed the Pantheon in praying for their dead. 
So this rededication of the pagan temple to Mary and others occurred in 610, and now converted into a Christian shrine, an annual festival was also instituted to commemorate the event, and the date that they chose was May the 13th. Now the Christian professing population, of course, Instead of paying homage now to their gods, now they paid homage to the consecrated pantheon and to those for whom it was dedicated. So, you know, all those paganized masses were now encouraged to pray to Mary and the other saints. And this day became known then as All Saints Day, which is a day on which prayers were offered for the souls of saints who had died. Now, the more prayers were you know, offered, it was believed, then the less those dead saints would suffer the interim time in purgatory and later even money was solicited for expiation purposes and you know those expiation purposes had uh, the goal to curtail the saints sufferings in 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 the so-called purgatory now all of this you know this commemoration of the dead saints going by the name of all saints day it continued to be held in may within uh, the empire until 834 in that year the name and the date were changed. And we read about that again in book Folklore on page 177. It says the name, the time of celebration was altered to the 1st of November and it was then called All Hallow, from where we get the name Halloween. All Hallow merely meaning All Holy and the in is a contraction of evening. So evening of All Holy. And we see that thus, you know, in 1834 AD, the church at large kept Halloween on the 1st of November for the first time. And yet, you know, however, this was still the very same day that the uh, Druids in Britain, the Norsemen in Scandinavia, and the pagan Germans, among others, were keeping their festival of All Souls Eve in commemoration of Saman, Saman, Shaman, Lord of Death, and his demons. Now, why did Romans change, you know, why did they change the date to November the 1st, which coincided then with the pagan feast of all souls? Well, the reason is very, very simple and probably very known to many people because it was a general practice of the Christianized Rome and Christianized Roman Empire and the church at Rome to convert the pagans within the empire quickly and on as large a scale as possible. Ever since the time of great pagan, who was a Mithra worshipper, Constantine the Great, ever since his time, you know, when he made Catholicism the state religion, the Roman emperors realized how essential it was to have a unified empire, where as many as possible would be of one mind. So what happened was that, you know, the civil and religious leaders, they saw how important it was for the sake of unity to allow only one religion within the uh, borders of the Roman Empire. And it became a stringent state policy to force all non-Christians to accept the Orthodox faith. Now, the condition for conversion, under quotation mark conversion, made it very easy for pagan population of Rome and elsewhere to accept Christianity. So, of course, if acceptance of Christianity was made simple, their refusal was made very difficult. And this plan of action led vast numbers of the heathen population within the empire to flock into the fold of the Roman church. Now those who also flocked to the church were also Germans. Because there was a German Frankish king, Charlemagne. And he invaded and conquered parts of eastern Germany. And when he did that, he compelled the conquered German Saxon king, whose name was Wittekind. He forced Wittekind to be baptized and to accept Christianity. Now, Wittekind's Germans, who are now professing Christians, and other conquered peoples, they had a profound influence on the ecclesiastical affairs of the church in the early 80s in the Roman Empire. And you see, these uncultural people, they brought with them many outright pagan practices and celebrations, so Halloween merely was one of those celebrations. And they were fervent in clinging to their past ceremonies and observed them openly, yet supposedly converted to Christianity. So what was the church to do? Well, was the church of Rome to excommunicate them and then reduce the number of its members? Oh, of course not. She wouldn't do that. Was the church to force them into discarding their heathen practices and adopt Italian or Roman practices? Well, you know, the church learned in the past times that that wasn't possible. So there remained only one other way. 
and that way was let the recently converted pagans keep certain of their heathen festivals, such as Halloween or All Souls Day, but label it Christian. And of course the Germans were asked not to pray of course to their ancient pagan gods on this day. They must now use this day to commemorate the death of their saints. So you see, if a pagan practice or festival could not be forbidden, it was reason, well, let it be tamed and let us just uh, adopt it. So, you know, thus many were persuaded to transfer devotion from their former gods to the Christian god. So it was with the festival of All Souls' Eve, it now became celebration in honor, supposedly, of a Christian god. In the book entitled Popular Antiquities of Great Britain, written by John Brand, on page 11, it is written about these uh, Gentile nations who accepted Christianity. It says, thus, at the first promulgation of Christianity to Gentile nations, they could not be persuaded to relinquish many of their superstitions, which rather than forego altogether, they chose to blend and incorporate with the new faith. So you see, the pagans didn't want to give up on their superstitions, so they blended them with their new customs. And you know, among those new customs, you had a dough, which is baked into small figurines resembling witches, and spider's web cakes, you know, which are baked by many people on that occasion. And then you have children dressed up in revolting costumes, and they're let loose on the neighbors. And here is, you know, here is a description from the last century. It is entitled, The Good Housekeeping Book of Entertainment. Mark this. Good Housekeeping Book of Entertainment on page 168. There is a section on what to do on Halloween. And here is, you know, amazing, astonishing, actually, advice. It says, Halloween decorations are quite as important as the food. When planning them, remember that if the room is to be dimly lit, preferably by candle or firelight, the decorations must be bold to be effective. Now, now in further text, we're going to read what are those bold decorations which should be effective. It says, orange, black and red, the devil's colors, are the colors associated with Halloween and this scheme should be carried out as far as possible. Have paper streamers and lanterns hanging from the ceiling, or if you would like to have something less usual, you could make a giant spider's web with black and orange strings, or in a narrow strips of creepy paper coming from the four corners of the room, complete with a large spider, one of the devil's favorite followers. Have you noticed, my dear friends, what is the stress on these instructions in the Good Housekeeping Book of Entertainment. The stress is on the devil's colors, the color orange, black and red, the devil's colors, and the stress is, you know, on the large spider's web and spider, one of the devil's favorite followers. The stress is on the devil. And then, in further text, it's uh, written about the black magic which is associated with Halloween. In these instructions, it says... To decorate the walls, make large silhouettes of cats, bats, owls and witches on broomsticks. For the super table small witches with broomsticks can be made by using lollipops on four inch sticks. End of the quote. And then later in text you can find, if you would read that, there are weird lanterns, witch balls and witches cauldrons and some other, you know, various objects that book suggest which must fit into the evening somehow. Now the question that you should ask all of yourself, whoever you are, all of you Christians out there who are so excited about Halloween, just tell me where is the biblical basis for all of these customs? You know, Halloween and other common festivals which people observe in the Christian professing world have no biblical foundation. Nowhere does the Bible which should be the foundation of our belief and our lives and our beliefs. Nowhere the Bible commands us to pray to anyone except God the Father and His Son or to make intercession for the dead. I don't know if you know that praying for the dead is not biblical. It's not a biblical practice at all. In fact, if you read in Psalm number 49, the Psalm, the 49th Psalm, and in verse 7, it says, None of them, can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. 
You see, my friends, none of God's people in the Old and New Testament, they none of them have ever prayed for so-called departed souls. And, of course, there is a good reason for that. The reason is that men, humans, they do not have immortal souls. Man is not an immortal soul. might be shocking to you, but that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible does mention soul, but not in the way that people believe today. So nowhere in the Bible do you have a person having an immortal soul. In other words, you know, there is no such thing mentioned, you know, in God's divine word as souls leaving the body at death. This erroneous idea also stems from paganism. The Bible does speak about a soul, but by the word soul, the Bible merely means a person, a human being, or a living being. In Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20, that prophet says, The soul that sins, it shall die. And he repeats that twice in that chapter. So, you know, if man had an immortal soul, he could not possibly die. So, you know, we have to keep in mind what the Bible says. Now, Halloween and several other annual festivals that people observe in this Christian professing world, they have no biblical basis, but they rather originate in paganism. And the testimony of history, you know, gives us a, a clear characteristic of Halloween. It basically labels Halloween as a festival with a pagan foundation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, the Bible warns us, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, or that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But of course, many people reason, and it's a merely human reasoning, devoid, devoid of any influence from God, Christian God, or they say, well, you know, what difference does it make, even if it is pagan? We don't worship demons. We don't worship any demons today. It's all harmless fun. It's for the children. And it just brings joy to our communities. But friends, the problem is, it is a religious holiday. And what does religion imply? It implies, you know, obedience, service, adoration, which is rendered to the object of one's worship. And, you know, religious holiday presupposes profession, practice, or observance of whatever belief and practice. And in this case, it is Halloween. And it, you know, it demands belief and practice as required by some superior authority. And because these Christian, these various Christian call holidays, including Halloween, which are now called Christian, and so Halloween is also called Christian, then one might assume that the authority cited would be the superior authority of the Christian faith, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. So one might just believe, oh, it must be the custom that Jesus Christ prescri prescribed. But the shocking point is, you know, nowhere in the Bible can anyone find that Jesus Christ commands, sanctions, or alludes to this holiday as something that the Christians should do. So, if you haven't discovered yet the source of religious beliefs, and if you haven't found yet whether you should observe them, well, go and search. Go and look. Unlike for many of us here in East Europe, and unlike many nations in the world, at least you people in English-speaking world have plenty of materials. They talk about your customs. One of such materials is written by Ruth Edna Kelly, in 1990, published in Boston in 1990, it's a collection of her findings and research about the popular customs. The title of her book simply says The Book of Halloween. You have it in audio format on internet. You have it in, in, in written format, in PDF, on internet as well. There is also a book written by Alexander Hislop, The Two Babylons, which he, in which he actually draws the parallels between the ancient and modern Babylonian society and Babylonian customs and shows us how much of the ancient paganism has been incorporated into modern Christianity. And there is also Halloween through 20, 20 centuries written by Ralph and Adeline Linton. You can find those three books and various other materials and articles online in English that tell you about the nature of Halloween. It's satanic holiday in honor of the God of this world, devil. So if you do not want to have curses brought that you bring by celebrating such a satanic holiday, then 
do not participate nor let your children be part of the festival in honor of Satan, the devil.